God is good. And all the time, <laughs> you can count on it. God's blessings are upon us. Oh, am I going the wrong way? I'm going the wrong way. There we go. All right, so that would be a good time to turn off your cell phone so that uh, you don't, somebody doesn't call you in the middle of service. And that's happened to me while I was preaching. So I'm going to go ahead and pre practice what I preach as well and turn off that cell phone. <laughs> and uh, if we have young children that are, uh, are crying, that's okay. But if they start to disturb, just know that we have people who would love to take care of them. Amen? Well, today is Pentecost. Amen. Yeah, that's exciting. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and uh, what is Pentecost, you, you might be asking? Well, Passover happens at Easter, right, in the Jewish tradition. Easter is, is, the, is Passover, and Pentecost would happen 50 days later, ergo the, the word penta, you know, which is five. So 50 days after Passover, you would have, there we go, Pentecost. And Pentecost was essentially a celebration of the first fruits, right, of harvest. So this would be the first, the time of first fruits. They would be harvesting the first fruits at, at this time. And so it was a celebration of that fact that God was pouring out blessings on them. Now we know from Acts chapter 2 that Pentecost was the day that really God began to pour out his first fruits of the growth of the church. We know that Christ said to the apostles, Stay in Jerusalem until you've received the Holy Spirit, right? And then the church at Pentecost exploded into life. Hallelujah. <laughs> so for sure, we understood that they were already believers, but it wasn't until Pentecost that the church received its mission and its motive to go forth into all the world. And so, that, so we're going to talk about Pentecost today. And today we're talking about Power, purpose, and planning. So stand with me, if you will, as I read uh, our verse today, which is uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And it should be around here somewhere. There it is, in French and in English. Amen. We always, wanna, we always want to uh, do honor to the Word of God. Let's read it here. It says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. May God bless his word in Jesus' name. You can be seated. Thank you so much. So here in the verse, you already have three things that we're going to talk about today in detail. Number one, you have the mention of power. We had a powerful prayer yesterday in Marrakesh was something like, with all the pastors, we invited all the pastors of Marrakesh to be together. There was something like, oh, I'd say 20, 20 pastors that gathered together to pray in the middle, of, in the midst of that prayer. We had a prayer that lasted for three and a half hours long, and the people didn't want to stop praying, amen? <laughs> I mean, we had people praying in every language you can possibly imagine, and uh, it was just beautiful to see people who, who, who saw the purpose in prayer. They understood that there was power in prayer. So, okay, well, I don't, I don't know if you can hear me still. It, oh, it's off. Okay. So, I mean, I can, do you want me to use the mic or no? It's okay? All right, cool. All right. I, I have a loud voice, uh, so my wife tells me anyway. So, I'm just going to keep preaching like this. If you guys don't mind, I don't mind. Uh, wouldn't be the first time. So, power, number one. You, eat, we, 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 you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. 1991, there was a service in, in, in Joss, Nigeria. Pastor Demi Bot was preaching. At the end of the sermon, Pastor Demi Bot said, anybody who wants to receive the Holy Spirit should come forward. 12-year-old Timothy Ligon ran forward because I knew it was my chance. I've been, I, I felt that I was called into ministry, and my feeling was, if I'm going to go into ministry, I need something. I need a touch. I need a special time with the Lord. We're going to talk about what Pentecostals mean when they say things like second grace. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't exclude uh, anyone 
from, a, from seeking the Holy Spirit and finding power in the Holy Spirit. Amen? <laughs> so what actions did the church take in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5? Well, Jesus said to them, Stay in Jerusalem until you have been clothed with power. <laughs> There's at least four things that I, well, I, I need to hit this real quick. I want to say to be Pentecostal is to be, is to wait on the Holy Spirit for His empowerment in any and all circumstances. I want to open that up. And that wasn't me that came up with that. That's Randy Hurst. Randy Hurst is a leader in my life and in the lives of many global workers, the ones that are connected with this church. And his job is basically to train us to be spirit-filled. <laughs> Isn't that a great job? He, he trains us to be spirit-filled. And his definition of, Pentecost, of, to be, of, to be, of Pentecostalism, to be Pentecostal is to wait on the Holy Spirit for empowerment in any and all circumstances. Well, anybody can do that. Anybody who's a Christian can do that, amen? Anybody who's a Christian should be waiting on the Holy Spirit. Anybody who's a Christian should be waiting to receive from God what they need so that they can step forward. And that's the power we're talking about. But the church did at least four things that I want to say. Number one, the church was obedient. Let me say clearly, and, and, and so it's so important that we understand this, because in today's world, with all the media and all the preachers that we see online, it's not often spoken. But the truly spiritual man of God is the man of God who is obedient to the Word of God. Your, your spirituality will never surpass your obedience. A man of God who is no longer obedient to the Word of God, but projects himself as spiritual, is delving into false prophecy, and he might lead the church astray. Jesus wants people who are obedient first and powerful second. Amen? Your anointing is not predicated on you. Your anointing is predicated on your obedience to God. God needs people to model obedience. And so the powerful, spiritual men of God in the world today are the ones who are still obedient to Jesus. And we see what happens. The Bible warns us that your sin shall find you out. We see what happens to powerful men who have been lifted up in the church, who have good anointings, but because they became disobedient somewhere along the way, we see that their sins do find them out. And the fall is great, and the fallout in the church is extremely, extremely hurtful. Obedience was the first thing that the church did. Number two, waiting. <laughs> waiting seems simple, but if you've ever sought to be, sought the Holy Spirit and sought direction from the Holy Spirit and sought power from the Holy Spirit then you know that waiting is hard. <laughs> Amen? It's very hard. Waiting is one of the most difficult. The practice of patience in the Christian life is one of the most difficult things that we give to God. Because we would rather work it out in our own power, in our own authority. Lord, I know how to fix this. I know how to manipulate this. I know how to speak to the people. I know who to call so that I can get what I want, rather than trusting that God is in control. Amen? <laughs> we need to learn to wait. Jesus told the church, wait. Number three, prayer. It is absurd to me that we consider a statement that takes less than one minute to be prayer. <laughs> It is a prayer, but that is not, I think, what Jesus meant when he was speaking to his disciples about prayer. Last Wednesday night, I was, uh, we, were, we had a prayer service, and I, I took a few people, and I said, okay, you're going to pray for 10 minutes straight. No stopping. We're just going to pray, and I gave each one a subject, and we just, I just let them pray. You know, 10 minutes seemed like a whole hour. <laughs> when, you haven't, when you're not used to it, work, prayer is work. You know, and so you have to start people off slow. But 10 minutes is, is, is actually asking something of people. Try it. <laughs> try it. Go home and try it tonight. 
10 minutes of prayer, you'll be surprised at how difficult it is to focus your mind on the Lord just for 10 minutes. That's why Jesus said to his apostles, you couldn't even take an hour with me? Right? Didn't Jesus say that? Jesus said, Can't you, couldn't you remain and pray with me for an hour? So Jesus' concept of prayer was not simply, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us our daily bread as we, for, you know, forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us, lead us not into temptation. That's not his idea of prayer. Yes, it was an example he gave. But his idea of prayer was something much more evidenced by his request to his apostles to have stayed with him in prayer. Jesus was the man that went into the wilderness for 40 days to pray. <laughs> prayer is necessary if you want to receive something from the Holy Spirit. If you want God to touch your life without prayer, you're asking for something that's impossible. But if you are willing to pray, God is willing to answer. Amen? And finally, unity. You know, the Bible says they were all together in one accord in Acts, in Acts there. They were all together in one accord. What does that mean? They were unified. One of the most important uh, things we requested yesterday of the pastors of Marrakesh, the Marakshis. Marakshi Afek. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, the most important thing we asked of our pastors was unity. Be unified. Doesn't mean we need to be the same. We had a Catholic priest in our midst. He was happy to be there. Uh, Père uh, Jean de Dieu. Because unity takes humility. It takes the understanding that, that I also need you. I told them a story. We, we read from Ephesians. I told them a story of when I was lost in the forest with a bunch of guys from Togo. And the key to my survival was listening to a little child, not even a school-age child. You know, this little child, when they take your hand, they just take your finger. They don't take your whole hand because their hand is so small and your finger is so big. But this little child knew how to get out of the forest, and I didn't. Not with my big car and my ten strong guys who were there to, to do the, the, the work of God in that place. I didn't know how to get out. But the child knew. Sometimes you might look down on the person who's offering you help. You might say, I'm supposed to teach you. I'm here for you. But we need to be humble enough to receive from everyone. Amen? And you'll be surprised when you humble yourself at who is able to teach you. And who has the key to your success. The key to our success that day was a child who could lead us to the place where we were going. Amen? So... What does it mean to be Pentecostal? To be Pentecostal is to wait on the Holy Spirit for empowerment in any and all circumstances. You can do that if you're Assemblies of God. You can do that if you're Baptist. You can do that if you're Catholic. You can do that no matter what denomination you're from. You can learn to wait on the Holy Spirit. Amen? In fact, Jesus... I don't even, I don't think that the, the apostles knew exactly what denomination they were at the time. They only knew that Jesus told me to wait until I was clothed with power. <laughs> Hallelujah! What is God asking you to do? So, the question arises, what is the normal experience? What is a normal experience of, the, of Pentecost? What happens when the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit touches me? And by the way, my wife grew up Baptist. I grew up Assemblies of God. Um, it's interesting how she defines these things versus how I define these things. She, she, she has moments with the Lord in which he comes on. He, 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 it's a special time with the Lord where he speaks to her. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what we call baptism in the Holy you know, <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I'm talking about. It's a different terminology, but it's the same thing. It's the same experience. Because everyone believes, every Christian believes, there are some men who, through prayer, through waiting, through unity, through obedience, get closer to God. If we didn't believe that, what is the purpose of church? Right? Isn't the purpose of church to, get, to, to help us become more like the image of Christ? Right? We're trying to build ourselves into the image of Christ. So all of us believe that we can get a little closer today. Amen? 
all of us believe we can take a step closer to Jesus. Of course we believe that. If we didn't believe that, we'd have to throw out mo most of the Bible and almost all the teachings of Christ. So what's normal in Pentecost? When the Spirit falls, there's at least two elements that emerge as normative, and, and those two are, number one, evangelical witness, and number two, evangelical proclamation. <laughs> when you get full of the Spirit of God, there's two things that happen to you. Number one, you want to tell people about it. You, you just want to. You want people to know the joy of the Lord. You want people to experience Jesus. You want people to have the freedom that you've had. You begin to get concerned about lost people in the world. You begin to have a heart for those who are suffering in the world. And that's because the Spirit of God has entered you, and it's taken your mind from the tyranny of self, and it's put your mind on other people around you. You become aware of others. Hallelujah! That's what happened to the church. They became aware of the world around them. And they took action. You know, people who pray for the Spirit of God almost always take action after they've felt God's Spirit in them. <laughs> what do I mean by that? In other, we, in other words, I mean it's not a dry, it's not a prayer where, Lord, just help us to do whatever it is you want us to do. No, that's generally not the kind of people that are praying for the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> people who pray that the Spirit of God touched them generally are thinking in their mind, Lord, I have this in my life. You see that I have this need. You see that this need's not going away. You see that I have this person I want to be saved. Lord, I want them to be saved. And they storm the gates of heaven. Am I not right? Is that not the way it works? <laughs> are those not the people who God touches powerfully? Those are the people, right? It's not the ones who are saying, Lord, I'm, I'm really happy the way it is. Everything's fine. No need to do anything, Lord. I'm, I'm just happy. And, but, I, you know, if you'd like to fill me with your Holy Spirit, it's great. No. People who, who, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, people who are clothed with the Holy Spirit, do so because they want action. They do so because they want action. They want something to happen. <laughs> Number two, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, things start to come out of your mouth. <laughs> and I'm going to say it like that, things. I've seen people prophesy when they're filled with the Holy Spirit. I've seen people speak in tongues. I've seen people, I've seen people quote scripture. Scriptures that they couldn't remember began to come out of their mouth. Boom, 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 boom. I've seen people, when they speak, speak with words that I didn't know they knew. We've seen people speak languages they didn't even know they knew, and other people understood them. The Holy Spirit is a, is a speaking spirit. And I want to say, there, there's, really, there's really nothing normal. There's really nothing normal when the Holy Spirit comes on you. There's really no normative experience. It's different every time. But at least those two things will probably be, will probably be in action. There will be a, a desire to witness to who Jesus is, and there will be a desire to proclaim who Jesus is. Spirit empowerment does cause noticeable changes. If you went to Acts chapter 8, verses 9 to 25, you would read about Simon the sorcerer. We don't have to... Simon the sorcerer had a, had a question for the apostles. He said, that gift that you have called the Holy Spirit, give it to me and I'll give you money. I, I'm not lying. Just go, just go read. It's really interesting. So Simon the sorcerer comes out with money. He's like, I'm going to give you some money and you give me the power to do what it is you're doing to people. <laughs> now, can I tell you something? If you... I don't care how you define spirit power, but the one way you cannot define it is you cannot define it as someone sitting quietly doing nothing. Why? Because what was it that Simon the sorcerer was trying to buy? Was he trying to buy quietly sitting nothing, doing nothing? See, see this is what, what I'm trying to tell you. Sometimes in our, in our theological defense, we say, but I was just as filled with the Holy Spirit as you were 
while I was sitting there doing nothing. No! You were not. <laughs> you need to admit that you were not. That God did not touch you, and that's why you did not feel anything. You did not say anything. You did not go and change anything in your life. You were not touched. Because Simon wanted to buy something. He had to have seen it. Amen? It means you didn't, you, if nothing happened, bro, nothing happened. That's number one. Number two, the apostles said something in Acts chapter 10, verse 47. They said, when Peter was called before the Sanhedrin, and there was, a, there was a, a, an argument. They said, Peter, who do you think you are? You're preaching to the Gentiles? Who do you think you are? And, and Peter says something. He says, they were filled with the Holy Spirit just like us. Now, there's no mention in Acts chapter 10 that fire came down into the room and was resting on their heads. There, the only mention was that they spoke in, in other languages. So I'm not making the case that I'm not making that case today. But what I am saying right now, right here, is that something happened that Peter saw. For Peter to be able to say to the apostles, they were filled with the Holy Spirit just like we were filled. Something happened. Hallelujah. <laughs> something needs to happen in your life. There needs to be a change that at least you are cognizant of. There needs to be, when the Spirit comes, there doesn't need to be a passive acceptance. There needs to be an active participation with the Spirit. Because the Spirit brings action. It is not passively accepted. It is actively participated in. If you want Holy Spirit power in your life, in your business, in your workplace, you have to participate with the Spirit of God. Somebody say amen. That's just reality. So, how have people reacted in the Bible when the Spirit came on them? That's really the question. Let's go to the Old Testament. When the Spirit falls, again, at least two elements emerge that seem normal. Number one, people start talking about God. And number two, well, number one, people start talking. Number two, it's about God. Okay? So once again, there's witness to God and His greatness. And then there's speech. There's speech. There's speech. People cannot be content when the Spirit comes on them not to speak. In the Old Testament, the Spirit hovered over the waters of creation. And what did God do? He spoke. And then, boom, everything came into existence. In Genesis chapter 6, the Spirit strived with people on earth before the flood. What was Noah doing? Speaking. Telling them, what are you doing? You're not following the Lord. Numbers 27, the Spirit was on Joshua, and he equipped him for leadership. Do you think that you can be a leader without speaking? <laughs> he was acting and speaking. The Spirit came on Othniel and equipped him for leadership. And he went and he spoke to the powers that be. The Spirit was with Gideon, equipping him for leadership. And, and Gideon went to the people and spoke to them about what God wants in their life. In Judges, uh, there we go, sorry about that. Judges uh, chapter 13, 25, the Spirit was with Samson and equipped him for leadership. And then finally, the Spirit was with Saul temporarily. And in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses uh, uh, 9 and 10, it says that Saul began to prophesy. He began to speak the word of the Lord. In the New Testament, the Spirit comes on people. It gives them either action or healing. Heals In, in Acts chapter 3, we see the, the apostles heal a crippled man. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I, have, I, give, up, I give unto thee. Rise and walk in Jesus' name. Ananias and Sapphira bring a, 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 a gift to the church that was involved in a lie, and the Spirit acts and kind of finishes that lie uh, along with Ananias and Sapphira. Healing of many people in Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. People were healed. Not through the apostles, by the way. <laughs> Most of the people were healed through Stephen, who was chosen by the apostles to be just a, a man who serves food uh, to, in the church. And so he was, he was a, an attendant of the church, but he was clothed with the Holy Spirit, and so he healed many people, according to the Word of God. Philip uh, he, he, uh, healed people in Samaria. Um, Philip was transported by the Spirit to speak to the Ethiopian who accepted the Lord and was baptized on, that, on the road to, uh, back to Ethiopia while reading Isaiah. And finally, Acts chapter 9. I could go on, but I'll stop there. 
Acts chapter 9, Saul's conversion. You know, the Spirit comes upon Ananias and says, Ananias, I want you to go pray for Saul. I want you to go speak to him, and I want you to pray for him. I want you to act, and I want you to proclaim. Okay? <laughs> so generally, in the Old Testament, there is a action. When the Spirit comes on you, there is action, and there is speech. Hallelujah. So at creation, you know, what are, the, what, are the, what are the kinds of speech? And let's talk about what kinds of proclamation come out of people. At creation, God spoke. Uh, in Numbers 11, Eldad and Medad prophesied. They began to prophesy, even though they weren't at the meeting. In 1 Samuel 19, Saul prophesied. And the word used here is interesting. Because it, it doesn't say he spoke in other languages. But what it does say is he spoke by the Spirit. The word used is prophetic utterance. It's a Hebrew word, and it just means prophetic utterance. It's interesting. It's very interesting. Because if you, if you look at it, if you look at it closely, you see that there's not really a division between Old Testament spirit power and speaking and New Testament. The only difference is the, the speaking in tongues for the purpose of going out. Okay? But the, but the spirit always spoke. So Saul, 1 Samuel 19, he begins to prophesy. David begins to prophesy through the Psalms. The Spirit of God comes on him and anoints him, and he begins to write Psalms. Simeon, in Luke chapter 2, says, Luke chapter 2, this is before the coming of the Holy Spirit, says the Holy Spirit came on Simeon, and if you read Luke chapter 2, verse 27, Simeon begins to speak and sing and talk about the greatness of God. At Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the apostles spoke in tongues, and then they preached the word. Now, I want to say something quick about speaking in tongues. Because I, 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 I don't want us to get confused here. When the confusion started at Pentecost in, in Acts chapter 2, when the people began to get confused because people were speaking in tongues, tongues stopped and preaching began. That's very important. That's very important. Because God is not the author of confusion. When we see things where it looks like there's craziness going on and there's no control, you can bet that probably God is not a part of that. I have never preached at someone, even though I, I, I have been filled with the Holy Spirit and I have spoken in tongues. Um, I have never preached in tongues. That would be utter nonsense and it would be disrespectful. It would be disrespectful to the people and to God because the Bible tells us very clearly that tongues are for the purpose of edifying yourself. So I wouldn't disrespect you by getting up here and speaking in tongues to you. That would be so disrespectful. And yet it's so common today. It's very common. Well, just go on YouTube. It's very common. That is not spirituality, friends. That is not biblical spirituality. It's not obedience. Because Paul tells us very clearly in 1 Corinthians that you shouldn't do such things like speak in tongues nonstop in front of at the when you're at church because it causes confusion. Paul's, Paul's explanation aligns with what Peter was doing. When Peter saw that the crowd was not understanding what was going on, the tongues stopped and preaching in a language that was understood began. Why? <laughs> because the proclamation of who Jesus is is the business of the Spirit of God. That's really powerful, actually. <laughs> I love that. The proclamation of who Jesus is, is the business of the Spirit of God. The business of the Spirit is not to make you feel warm and fuzzy. It's not to make you look powerful. It's not to make you shake. It's not to make you do weird things. It's not to simply make, it's not even to heal. It, those things are all secondary to the number one purpose of the Spirit of God. And that is to tell the world about Jesus. Jesus said when the Comforter comes, he will explain everything of what I am. He said the Spirit of truth will come into you. <laughs> Hallelujah! So I would say if, if there's anything normal about spirit power, people who are filled with the Holy Spirit are very concerned with talking about Jesus. That's normal. Keep in mind that the, the, the Holy Spirit empowers both understood and and. and, and language and, and language that's not understood but the point is the prophet the, the spirit of a prophet is subject to that prophet and the bible tells us that we should do everything with love in mind and just go to first corinthians chapter 12 13 and 14 to see how to use the gifts that the holy spirit has given you wisely if you say 
that tongues have ceased, then you also have to say the hospitality has ceased. I don't believe that tongues have ceased. I just think they're more rare than perhaps we think they are. Because people, I think, I think they've become something that people think they have to do in order to show that they're full of the Spirit. But you don't. Hallelujah. <laughs> you can be full of the Spirit. And you should be full of the Spirit. And you should allow the Spirit to give you the gifts that He wants to give you. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Okay, so purpose. What is the purpose? We already touched on it already, but spiritual empowerment will always be witness to Jesus. Why do you want to be saved? You'll receive power to be my witnesses. Amen? Why are you going to receive power? Are you going to receive power so you can start a ministry? Are you going to receive power so that you can be viewed as amazing? No. The purpose of power is so that you can talk about Jesus to other people. That's what it will always be. John 15, 26 says that the Spirit will talk about me. That's what Jesus said. The Spirit's going to talk about me. So, how did the, how did the, well, we'll come to that. How did the Holy Spirit witness in the Old Testament? The people of God were carriers of the gospel. They, the Israel was the carriers of the gospel. If the world was to know who God was, then they would have to know through Israel. Israel had a relationship with God, and they shared that with the world. So people would come to Israel. But today, the church, the people of God, carry the, carry the word of God to other nations. We don't wait for them to come to us. The temple is now in our hearts, no longer a physical b structure. And now we go into all the world. We carry the gospel outwards, but it's the same, it's the same God and the same spirit. 1 Peter 2.9 tells us that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the, the, praise, the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into wonderful light. And the early church understood this, and they understood this so well that they took the gospel everywhere throughout the world, from Jerusalem to the whole world. They did exactly what this uh, verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, told them to do, and it spread throughout the earth. And by the way, there at that moment, there weren't any leaders to tell them not to do that. <laughs> Praise God. We, <laughs> Christianity got organized later. <laughs> and once it got organized, it began to get a little more heavy and there began, to, there began to be questions about whether or not you should really be telling people about Jesus. But in the beginning, it wasn't like that. In the beginning, anybody who had Jesus was supposed to share him. Amen? <laughs> so Israel was not called out, but the apostles were called out. They were called out after they were told to remain. But after the Spirit came into Israel and the church you know, after, after Israel became, uh, after the church took the mantle of Israel, so now we are, we, we are taking the gospel out. We are called to go out into all the world, to, uh, world and make disciples. According to Matthew 28, 19, go into all the world and make disciples. So what happens when we go into all the world and make disciples? Well, if we're filled with the Spirit, we should have the fruit of the Spirit. What's the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Uh, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Well, do all Christians have these aspects? No. Does that mean they're not Christian? Probably not. They probably still are Christians. What it does mean is they're not full of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen? So when you lack, when you lack love, joy, peace, patience, kindness... You haven't lost your salvation. You've lost the Spirit, friend. This is why I know you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Because when you get close to the Spirit, you look more like Him. Hallelujah. <laughs> so if you're lacking these gifts, if you're lacking, these are not gifts, if you're lacking this fruit, it's because you're lacking the presence of the Spirit of God in your life. And the solution is you need to be closer to Him. Now, I'm not going to please everybody in this sermon. There's a, side, there's a group here that wants me to say you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And the reason they want that is because they want the best for you. They want you to seek something to get it. But let me tell you a reality. Even after you're baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I still want you to find more than that. And Jesus wants you to find more than that. Amen? Paul said, seek the best gifts. And can I tell you, 
You should never stop seeking, no matter where you are, no matter how you had it, no matter what, what you've received from the Lord. And whatever you've received from the Holy Spirit is good, but you should never stop asking for more. Amen? So that's, the, so that's the first thing that we see when the Spirit comes in us. We see those kinds of traits, love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. But then the Bible also tells us about the gifts of the Spirit, and I don't know why that's so small. Christ himself gave the apostles and the prof the gifts of the, this is, yeah, it, there's a slide missing. Anyway, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there we, the Bible talks about the gifts of the Spirit. You can look that up. They're not exhaustive. But the, the gifts of the Spirit are things like a message of wisdom for your neighbor, a message of knowledge for your neighbor, faith to go through difficult times, a gift of healing, miraculous power, prophecy, distinguishing of spirits, speaking in tongues. And it says that the Spirit gives as He wills. These gifts, your gifts may coincide with your calling, or they may not. There are pastors who have no discernment. There are pastors who don't speak in tongues. There are pastors who don't have the gift of healing. But they're still called. Because Ephesians tells us, because we don't want to get these mixed up, Ephesians tells us that he gave some to be... Uh, so Christ himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers to equip the people of God. And so your calling may coincide with your gift, but it may not as well. There are people, you may be called to be a prophet, but if you live in sin, you're not going to work in the prophetic because you don't have the gift. <laughs> you cannot disobey God and have the gift of, of prophecy. You'll, you'll become a false prophet. Trust me, you won't be hearing from the Holy Spirit. You'll be hearing from some spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. But you might have a calling to be a prophet. You might have a calling to speak the word of God in the church. But because your life doesn't match up with the spirit of God, you don't have the gift. But on the other hand, you may be called to be a pastor, but you don't seek discernment. You don't ask the Holy Spirit to give you discernment. So you empower all kinds of craziness in the church because you're just, <laughs> you're going by your own idea. Hallelujah. And so don't get those three separated. We have a calling of a person, apostle, teacher, prophet, pastor. You have the gifts of the Spirit, speaking in tongues, pro miracles, prophecy, uh, you know, uh, faith. And then you have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Of all those three, the one that should always exist is the fruit of the Spirit. No matter the calling, no matter the gifting, the one that you should seek, if I can say the most important, is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit should always be found in our lives, and it can only be found when we're in proximity with the Spirit of God. Finally, planning. Pentecost was an outward movement. We see here your strategy should inform you, but it should never command you. Pentecost was an outward movement. The Holy Spirit told the church where to go and how to go. Strategy does not negate spirit power. We can be organized in the church and still be filled with the Holy Spirit. Just because I plan how my service goes doesn't mean I don't give time to the Holy Spirit. Amen? We can have structure and also be spirit-filled people. In fact, Paul tells us you should have some structure in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. But not everything that is spontaneous is spiritual. <laughs> Just because you feel like God told you to jump up and run around the room doesn't mean you're any more spiritual than the person who's sitting down. Amen? <laughs> In fact, you might be less spiritual <laughs> because you're trying to show uh, show off in a, in a way. Paul had a strategy. In Acts chapter 16, verse 6, he said, I was going to go. You know, Paul and his companions were traveling to the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Paul's strategy was to go to Asia. He thought, this is a good strategy. I'm going to go to Asia. I'm going to preach the gospel. Why would the Spirit be against it? But what does the Bible say? The Spirit constrained him. He was listening to the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit said, no. <laughs> in the church, we do not lift our strategy. We do not lift our doctrine. We do not lift our theology. Those things inform us. They tell us why we think the way we think. But they are not our God. If the Holy Spirit speaks to me, I'm going to be obedient to him. Amen? Even if it means 
You're not normally supposed to raise your hand in church or you're not normally supposed to say amen or whatever. I'm going to do it if the Holy Spirit leads me to do it. Amen? Amen. Strategy, structure is for the benefit of the people. But it's not our God. Amen? It should bless us, but it shouldn't control us. And so many people today have gathered together and they've gotten a great strategy and they said to themselves, I know how to reach such and such a country and this is how you do it and it's only like this and anybody who's not doing it like this doesn't know what they're doing. Can I tell you, God has a way of using foolish little people who are listening to him rather than using wise people with good strategy. Trust in the Holy Spirit. Being led by the Spirit doesn't mean you know where you're going, but it does mean that you know who's leading you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so, I, I, we're just going to pray. Let's, let's, let's stand and pray. Today is Pentecost, and I challenge you, my challenge for you is to go deeper. If that means you want to see more of the fruit of the Spirit in your life, go deeper. If that means you've always wanted to ask God to bless you with the gift of the Holy Spirit, one of the gifts, maybe I've asked the Lord many times. He hasn't given me the gift of administration, but I need the gift of administration. All he does is give me people with the gift, but I don't have that gift. Um, but I've asked, you know, and, and, and I'm continuing to ask. But we should continue to ask the Lord for the best gifts. Let's ask. And then, and then finally, if, if, if you're thinking... Maybe I have a call in my life. Maybe God's saying to me, you're a, you're a pastor, you're a teacher, you're an apostle, you're an evangelist. Let's ask. Let's ask again. Let's take a moment, church, just within yourself to, to ask yourself. I don't know if we have someone who can play the steering or something like that. Let's just ask ourselves before I pray. What would the Lord have me do to get deeper? It's not about, it, I don't want it to be about the, the, the way you look. I want it to be about your depth with the Holy Spirit. Because trust me, people who try to get closer to the Holy Spirit, they don't, they get everything. <laughs> they get all of it. They get the blessings of joy. They get proclamation. They get witness. They become the very thing that Jesus wanted them to become. So let's wait and ask ourselves. something you need to do to get closer if there's a sin that's in the way you know that if I stop doing that sin I could probably get closer then, then just get rid of that sin you need to just decide today this, that, that's over I want more of you Lord Jesus I want more of your spirit I'm going to let go of that sin if there's a, a hardness of heart Lord I, you know sometimes we become hardened because we sought the Lord, and he didn't give us what we wanted. But let's do it humbly. Let's change our strategy. Let's say this, Lord, whatever you want, that's what I want. If you don't want to give me anything, that's okay. But give me more of your presence. Amen. The most spiritual people are the ones who are obedient. If you can be obedient, you're already, you're already so spiritual. Are you obedient in your walk with Christ? Do you spend time with him? Do you abide with Christ daily? Do you talk about Jesus when people ask you, or do you hide your testimony? Is that what Jesus asked to do, us to do, to hide our testimony for our own safety? Is that what he said? He said, those who are ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of them. Right? Right? some way we have to give a testimony even if it's dangerous some way we have to are we being obedient church is there some time that we know that we should be giving to God time that we should be giving to our family but we're not giving it are we taking a sabbath do we, believe, do we trust God to take time with our family and not work 
say, God, I'm going to take time with my family because I trust that you have my blessing. Only you know, only you know what the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. Let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, I pray for all of us. Challenge me, Lord God, challenge us. Challenge us, Lord God, again to trust in you, to get closer to the Holy Spirit again, to believe that the Holy Spirit wants to call us into our calling. He wants to gift us into what we're doing, and he wants to gift us with, his, with the fruit of his Spirit, to grow in us the fruit of the Spirit. Father, we see the power that <laughs> when people are filled with your Spirit, we see the power. We know it exists. We don't deny, Lord God, that in every stream of every denomination, there are people that seem to be empowered by you. In the Catholics, Lord God, in the Baptists, Lord God, in the Assemblies of God, Lord God, we see the Spirit rest on people and use them. So we don't deny your power, Lord God. We don't get into that argument that is meaningless. But we ask, Lord God, that you empower us. We ask, Lord God, that you would give us purpose. That you would remind us that if we are empowered, if we are emboldened, if the Spirit is upon us, it's for the purpose of speaking about Jesus and lifting up Jesus. And finally, Lord God, we ask for your planning in our life. All of us have a strategy, Lord God, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we pray, Lord God, that our strategy would never become our God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord God, and challenge all of us today to get closer. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Well, actually, no, don't be seated. <laughs> uh, I think we're just going to close. We don't have any announcements. Do we have any? No? Yeah. So for baptism, next Sunday, I think, will be the last Sunday. Worship team, do you want to come up um, so we can end? Uh, I'll just do some announcements and we can end with some worship. Um, next Sunday will probably be the last Sunday that I'm taking taking notices for baptism because I need time to train people, okay? So seriously, 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 if you know someone that hasn't been baptized or if you haven't been baptized or you'd like to be baptized, please give me enough time to, to disciple, okay? Because we, the last thing I want to do is just make it a, a ceremony. Who needs that, right? Who needs more religion? Do you? I don't. I don't want more religion. I don't want to just put you in water and, yeah, it's done. No, I want to make sure, it's my job as a pastor to make sure that you are not just Christians, but good Christians. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> so we want to be good Christians, okay? And uh, so please, by next Sunday, that's probably the last time I'm going to ask because I need, I need time to disciple you. So after that, if you ask to be baptized after next Sunday, I'm probably going to say yes, but not now. Yes, but later, Okay? To be clear, um, even so, somebody will ask. And then for for <laughs> for uh, for children, dedication, dedicating your child. Why? Why do we do that? Is it for salvation? I just want to make this clear. Your child one day will be talking to you about God, and you're going to turn to them and you're going to say, "On this day, I dedicated you to the Lord." On this day, I dedicated you to the Lord, and you are his. And that statement will be enough to hold them in the grip of grace forever. Let's do it, okay? Give that to your child, you know? Give that to a child. All right. Do we have a song we can sing? Go ahead. Lord, I give Let's sing together. My heart. Hallelujah. I give you my soul. I live for you, and Lord, every breath that I take, every moment I'm waiting. Lord, have your way. Lord, I give. Lord, I give. Give you my soul. I live for you, the Lord. Every breath that I take, every moment I wait, Lord, have your way in me. Amen. Before we
we say the blessing, I just want to say when you go from this place, be full of the Spirit of Jesus. Be in love with Jesus. Talk about Jesus with your friends. <laughs> be Jesus with skin on to your friends. Think about Jesus. Sing about Jesus. Walk with Jesus. Abide with Jesus. Make Jesus your all in all. Amen. And you'll be the kind of Christian that he will say, that's my child right there. And that's what we want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. Let's say this blessing together as we leave. May the grace of, of the Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ and, and the love of the, the Father and the, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit be upon us. us. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go from this place and bring you back here next Sunday. Lord.